Well, get on with it. We're listening, said Dede, straining to keep the laughter from bursting out of his voice. Here is what happened. Le Potre made a final puff and drew himself up to his most solemn height. Unfortunately, whenever he pulled up his shoulders, his round belly popped out in a comical arc. Nevertheless, he went on. I was approaching the house. I was putting out my hand. I was choosing the trap I would take. Go on, said Nokomis, grim with protective fury for her friend, old Tallow. Anyway, said Le Potre, I was about to close my fingers on the trap when I heard a voice. Nobody really wanted to encourage Le Potre, but at last Angeline could not contain her curiosity. What did it say? It said, Le Potre leaned forward and fixed them, all with his keenest, slightest, cross-eyed stare. Gago. In other words, the voice said not to do what I was doing. I opened my eyes. My friends, a crow was sitting there, its eyes black and shiny as lake stones. My friends, it spoke to me, Anin. It said, Anin. I answered, Anin, I answered, Gago. It warned me again, then flew off. The potre sat back and folded his arms across his chest. He waited for the sounds of amazement and the hushed tones of respect. He waited for the nods from Dede and the serious expressions of wonder from Mama and Nokomis. Instead, after a moment of amazed delight, his entire audience burst into howls of laughter. Dede was overcome with hilarity, and every time he tried to explain to Lepotre, he sank into helpless sobs and guffaws. Nokomis and Mama were holding each other and laughing so hard, tears came down their cheeks. Angeline had turned away and was pounding the dirt, pinched him up and down, yelling. Omakias was laughing, for another reason besides the coincidence, for Andig was near, had survived, might come back some day. Lepotre, slowly picking up his things, turned to the lap turned to the laughing family in a state of bewilderment. He put out his hands as though to ask, but then, when Dede tried to blubber an explanation, only to collapse in fresh laughter, Lepotre swiped his hand through the air and scratched his head. This was definitely not the reaction he'd expected. As he walked away, he wondered whether the entire family had eaten some sort of strange medicine, taken leave of their senses, perhaps? He stroked his chin. Yes, he'd sleep on it. Maybe his guardian bird, the crow, would return and speak to him again. Maybe he would have another vision and somehow obtain an answer. Again, it was time for the family to plant. Yellow Kettle chopped at the tough, winter-packed earth of their family garden. While the others broke dirt clods and struggled with roots, picked stones and smoothed out rough rows to plant, Pinch pretended to help. He kicked at tiny weeds and smooth circles in the dirt with his hands. He threw mud balls until Yellow Kettle gave her hoe to him and told him that if he stopped working just once, she would take away all of his play warrior weapons. His lower lip stuck out. He grumped. As he dug into the earth, he wished he was a grown man, already with nothing of this sort to bother him. Still, he found himself occasionally dragging the cooks of water over to splash on Amakias' plant seeds. His sister even thanked him once, which made him so warm and shivery inside that he had to run and shout louder than ever at nothing. The pumpkin seeds wore little silver patches like French medals, and Nokomis blessed them gently as she pushed them into the soft new earth. The corn seeds were chubby and yellow in Amakias' fingers. Angeline had acquired from Fishtail some corn with red flecks in it, and Mama put these seeds into the ground with a special blessing, curious to see what their growth would bring. The ground harbored the sunshine and spread warm beneath her feet. As she planted one hill after another, Amakias felt the calm and sweetness of the earth, and tears burned. Where was Niwo? She missed him. When they had finished planting, as though summoned, rain sprinkled down in a mist. The shower deepened the calm of the woods, ticked through the new leaves, lightly wetted the seeds sheltered in the earth. Suddenly, just as they were leaving the field, Ondig appeared, wheeling through the air, dive-bombing the family with his familiar crock, crock. 
Andrig swooped near but refused to land with his usual sweep on Omakias's shoulder. Come, come, Ambe, called Omakias with a thrill of happiness. Pinch, who never was still, never kept himself from excitement, acted differently. He stood motionless and waited right next to his sister. He seemed to know something that Amakias, in her eagerness to hold her pet, couldn't grasp. Ondeg had become half wild, afraid of humans. Amakias's waves and the anxious calls were frightening to him. Pinch, on the other hand, actually understood that the quieter he stood, the more likely their old friend was to trust him. And sure enough, Ondeg did land, right on Pinch's head. Pinch's eyes rolled up. He tried to see Ondeg. The bird hopped up and down, uttering his greeting. Crack, crack, crack. Amakias was hurt, but instantly. And this was the gesture that forever changed the nature of the friendship. Between her and her little brother, Pinch gently edged next to her, his sister, and with a short hop, her Andig jumped onto Amakias's shoulder. In the old days, Pinch would have teased her and made her feel bad because her bird preferred him. Something had changed. Megwitch, little brother, said Omakias, surprised to say the word. Pinch didn't seem to hear. He ran off immediately, shouting his head off. Tears burned in Omakias's eyes, for as soon as Andig was on her shoulder, he trusted her once more. He pecked at the silver cross, hopped onto her head, gazed at her with the old, curious, questing expression, expression of bird intelligence. As they started back from the field, he rode on her shoulder. Tenderly, as they walked along, the bird plucked up a strand of hair that had fallen loose from Amakias's braid, and then he tucked it behind her ear. Not long after Old Tallow brought deer bones to share with Grandma. For a time, the two women sat by the outdoor fire. The air was cool and the fire burned high, stacked with dry wood. Nokomis baked the deer bones, cracked them, and used a special long curved spoon to scoop out the hot, rich marrow. After a while, Nokomis went out to look for Pinch, and Tallow called Amakias over to sit near the fire with her. Have some tea, she said. I made it fresh. Omakia shook her head, suspicious. Tallow was behaving in too serious and friendly a manner. Since when did old Tallow make tea? Since when did she act as though she had something important to say? Omakia tried to slip back into the lodge, but the tough woman seized her hand and bent her fingers around the handle of the cup. She had something in mind in this visit, it was clear. But Amakias decided that whatever it was, she didn't want to confront it. Ever since she had a taste of old Tallow's justice, she'd been wary of the fierce woman. And now, stubborn, Amakias waited. She felt something flare in her heart. She didn't like to be bossed around. Unwillingly, Amakias accepted the cup and took a sip. Good. While you're drinking this, said old Tallow, her strong, ropey arms arranged on her knees, her big feet breaking from her moccasins as usual, her hat pulled, low and fierce, eyes and her fierce eyes flashing. I'll tell you a story of Omakias. I'll tell you the story of Omakias. Maybe that will help you get over your little brother. Omakias put the cup down, picked it up again, at Tallow's ab abrupt gesture. All right, I'll drink it. What do you mean? Omakias frowned. What was this? A plan to get her to forget all about Niwo? She wasn't interested. She was still sad and loyal to her tiny brother. What did Tallow understand? Bitterly, she spoke. I know the story of Omakias. It all happened in the winter. She had a beautiful friend, a favorite baby brother. They die. She is left to cry for them. Not that story. What other story do you know about me? She wanted to tell the old woman to let her be, to go off and hunt her favorite occupation. But because Otala was, after all, an elder, and because Mama had always insisted that Amakias be polite as possible to her elders, Amakias pretended to listen to the story. When you were very tiny, old Tallow began, what do you mean when I was very tiny? Amakias tried to be good, but irritation burst out of her. Mama had me, not you, and she held me, fed me, dressed me, all of those things. 
What do you know? What more is there to say? Old Tallow drew a deep breath. Her eyes almost crossed with fury, but she kept her temper. You don't have any excuse to be rude, no matter how sad you are. You can't treat me in this disrespectful way. Omakias felt her throat shut with shock and embarrassment. She wanted to cry. Why was she acting like this? Eh, yeah, okay then, I'm sorry, she said, more softly. What are you going to tell me? Haven't you wondered, said Old Tallow, a bit testy with the difficult girl Machias had become, hasn't it occurred to you to ask why you didn't get the Chimukaman sickness? You didn't get sick, said Omakias, stubborn. I never get sick, said Tallow. Nokomis did well. Your grandma already had the smallpox. Omakias remembered the tiny whited pit in the skin of her grandma's cheek, but was still surprised to hear that Nokomis too had suffered the disease. She pondered for a moment, and then could not hide her curiosity. What about me? she demanded, abrupt as old Tallow herself. You too. Me too what? Had the scratching sickness. A panicky feeling bubbled up inside Omakias, and she wanted to laugh to drive the feeling off. I couldn't have. You wouldn't remember exactly what happened. You were a baby. Then why didn't Mama have it? Why did Mama get sick too, this time? Because, said old Tallow, you weren't with your Mama then. Omakias wanted to stop talking now. She could feel it. There was something else, something coming toward her, something deeper and huger than she didn't want to know. That she didn't want to know. She tried to stop herself from asking the next question, but her curiosity was too great. She felt her voice rise. Where was I? A different island, said Old Tallow. Her voice was stern, but there was an ache in her look that Omakias had never before seen. An island called Spirit Island, where everyone but you died of the itching sickness. You were the toughest one, the littlest one, and you survived them all. Tallow smiled mirthlessly, grim. Starvation nearly got you next, but I managed to cheat the old hungry skull, fed you broth of rabbits, brought you back with me. This was before you were two winters old, my girl, before you said words yet, before you can remember anything. Omakias tried to grasp what she was he hearing. Her heart tumbled into darkness and she could not speak. Now the line was crossed. She had to know everything. Mama, Dede, Nicomas, they took you as their daughter, loved you as their daughter. You are a daughter to them, and a sister to your brother and to Angeline. You? Why did you give me away? Oma blurted Omakias. Old Tallow glared away into the distance. Count yourself lucky. What kind of life with an old bear hunter like Tallow? Nobody has ever stayed with old Tallow. She drives them off. Eh, hey, yeah. The two sat together for a long, long time. There, at the fire with the darkness gathering above them, and to all sides. Old Tallow made a move to leave, but Omakia said, her voice strange and hollow and small, Daga, please, don't go. Inside, she knew that there was something still to ask. Something about the story, which seemed both unbelievable and perfectly understandable all at once, but she couldn't put it into words. Tallow went on speaking. I know now the reason you were sent to Yellow Kettle, to the old woman, to your day day, your brothers, said Tallow. She wrestled in the tatters of her dress, groped for her smoking pipe, then remembered she was out of tobacco, and let her hands splay restlessly in her lap. You were sent here. So you could save the others, she said, because you'd had the sickness. You were strong enough to nurse them through it. They did a good thing when they took you in, and you saved them for their good act. Now the circle that began when I found you is complete. Omakias knew the question she needed to ask. She took a deep breath and asked it forthrightly. Found me? How did you find me? How did you know I was there unless you were on that island, unless you too survived the sickness? Now, old Tallow fell silent, and in her mulling, Omakias could tell there was some unwillingness, something she did not want to say, 
but she shrugged eventually and told it outright. There is a canoe of men, my husband, hat among them. They passed by Spirit Island, saw the dead, saw you. So it was they who brought me back? No, said Tallow simply. They saw me, said Omakias, making sure, but they didn't save me. Old Tallow shook her head in the dusk. Then she shook herself all over, just like one of her dogs. Hein, my husband Hat, was a fearful fool. I was going to put his things out the door anyway. When he told me that he and the other men had seen you and gone on leaving you, Old Tallow's voice took fury. I made him leave. Don't show me your face, ever, I said to him. And then I took my canoe over to that island. The wintry trees clacked their branches, ticking and moaning. The wind picked up often at dusk on the island. Omakias could feel in her heart what it was like for that baby, for herself, all alone, with the dead, with her mother, walking from those she loved as though walking stone to stone. Somehow, deep inside, she remembered. It was spring, she said softly. Zigun. Oh, wah, said old Tallow in surprise, peering closely at her. You remember? The birds, said Omakias. I remember the birds, the song of the birds. Oh, wah, Tallow was excited. I had forgotten myself. There were birds on that island singing so prettily, so loudly, too small to eat. The little birds with white throats, those sweet spring cries. Eh, ya, my girl, you remember them. They kept me alive, said Omakias to herself, not quite understanding her own words. I remember their song because their song was my comfort, my lullaby. They kept me alive. Omakias woke to a piercing spring music. Morning. It was morning, and it was the very same song she remembered from the other island so long ago. This morning, in a tree near the birch bark house, she heard the white throated sparrows calling out to one another. Where are you going? Angeline asked sleepily. Out, said Omakias. Erg, said Pinch as she stepped over him and out into the fresh dawn world. The sun was just peeping over the water, its light winking and growing. All around her there sounded voices of hundreds of white-throated sparrows. In the mild air of spring they were singing cheerfully, sweetly, as though to keep her company on the first morning of her life that she, Omakias, knew the truth of her past. She was the girl from Spirit Island. She lived in a birch bark house. This was the first day of the journey on which she would find out the truth of her future, who she was. Singing, singing, the little birds told her something more. Their delicate song surrounded her, running in waves through the leafless trees. Omakias walked toward the strongest center of their music, and then, on a patch of thawed grassy ground, she lay back in the sun, her head against the bark of a fallen log. The birds, the whole earth, the expectant woods seemed to wait for her to understand something. She didn't know what. It didn't matter. Drowsily, she whistled along with the tiny sparrows. Inga, bee, 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 bee. Inga, bee, 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 bee. Those, ti those sweet, tiny, far-reaching notes were so brave. The little birds called out repeatedly in the cold dawn air. And all of a sudden... Omakias heard new, something new in their voices. She heard Niwo. She heard her little brother as though he still existed in the world. She heard him tell her to cheer up and live. I'm all right, his voice was saying. I'm in a peaceful place. You can depend on me. I'm always here to help you, my sister. Omakias tucked her hands behind her head, lay back, closed her eyes, and smiled as the song of the white-throated sparrow sank again and again through the air like a shining needle and sewed up her broken heart.